Okay, so I'm live, huh? What's happening, folks? I'm live. As you can see, I'm pretty much clean shaved, right? Hopefully, we'll have the regular showing up in a few minutes by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my shoulders. What's going on? You guys can hear me? Sound check? Thanks for the Titus. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Raphael Israeli. Praise Jesus Christ. People may not know because they don't read the section. Thanks for the series. I destroyed a JW because of you. Hallelujah, brother. That's why I'm doing the series, to equip you to get Joe's witnesses to see who the true God is and repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell us what happened. Salt bath, help with sickness. Yeah. You know, fill us in because we have a few minutes before I start. Yes, Raphael, it's not that you need help. You need to be aware your arguments will not make anyone a christian your responses won't make anyone a christian your witness apologetics evangelism will not make anyone a christian that's the holy spirit's role as long as you're faithful to what the holy spirit commands you to do and the holy spirit works through you trust the holy spirit will bring about the results that god intends right it's the holy spirit by the grace of the lord jesus christ say hello father the spirit Okay, well, Raphael, Israeli, newborn baby, yeah, right? The Holy Spirit is what convicts people and opens their hearts and minds and fills their heart with love for the true God. They can be religious, they can worship a false God, but to worship the true God as he's revealed himself, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we're false spirit. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. We are supposed to meet for dinner in an hour. I have no clue what you're talking about, Rabbit, rabbit Wolf. Yeah, I guess we're, we're not. I guess we're not going to meet. I don't know. <laughs> That's news to me. All right. Unless you're that person that contacted me. Yeah, but I told you, you know, I wanted to confirm your identity. I needed to see who it is. Never sent a picture, so I don't know. But anyway, as you guys can see, I shaved my beard. And you can see I got a slight chin and I got a birthmark, right? You know what I've noticed? No, I didn't get anything, Rabbit Wolf. I got nothing, so probably going to uh, send again. But anyway, I don't want to be distracted. I want to focus now about Jesus Christ. I've noticed one thing. Genetically, my, share, my shoulders are very narrow, and I have a big head. So no matter how much weight I lose, my head is still big, and my shoulders are narrow. Many of you know that I've said that before I got into the faith, I used to be into to bodybuilding. I was a bodybuilder. So I used to work extra hard to make my shoulders and lats super wide because they're narrow, just genetically. That's genetics, right? And I've been trying to get back in the gym to get my muscles back, but more importantly, my health back. But even more important than that, I just want to be holy and in love with Jesus Christ, right? So pray. The Lord Jesus helps me to get my health back. But being here in L.A., I haven't been able to hit the gym. So pray I can get my health back, get my muscle tone back. But more importantly, pray that I am sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ, radically holy, radically pure, radically righteous, and passionately love with Jesus Christ, right? But I'm trying to get my health back. So you can see I can still do this, right? I'm getting there. I used to have big arms, by the way, muscles, uh, big biceps and tries, but delts. I used to have to kill myself. But hey, man, I'm not too shabby. I think I'm still handsome, gorgeous. I can be a model. Anyway. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to wait a few more minutes and we're going to begin. Come on, Raphael. Raphael, my friend. Raphael, you know, you're starting to disturb my spirit, even though I love you. Zarina, may the Lord Jesus richly bless you, sister. May the Lord Jesus comfort you. May the Holy Spirit fill you with peace, joy, and love. And may the surgery be a perfect success. In Jesus' name, pray for this sister. She's going to have surgery, so pray the Lord Jesus will be with Zarina. Raphael, can I ask you a question, my brother? Thank you, Bukhil. May I radiate with the beauty of Jesus. May I be handsome with the beauty of Jesus. Raphael, can I, can I ask you a question? You see the title is, Is Jesus the Archangel Michael Part 4? You just asked me two questions not directly related to refuting that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. 
do you want me to stop and shut down the live stream and retitle it q a and i say this brother because i can't under honestly I, I pray by the power of the holy spirit in jesus name i know i can offend people i don't i don't want to honestly i don't want to offend anyone i don't want to be an unnecessary stumbling block i want to be a blessing and serve you but it irritates me that we christians can't focus we Christians can't be disciplined. And that's me too. Me. I'm guilty of it. Brothers and sisters, you see the title, right? Is Jesus the Archangel Michael, part four. Why then as Christians who read the title would then ask me questions that would have me go off of, off topic? Right? Why would you guys do that? Right? I, I, don't, I honestly don't understand. I don't understand. Is it because we lack discipline and focus? Because we do live in a time in which our, our attention span is quite short. Quite short, right? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? We live in fast food theology. We got to get it fast and quick. And we have to have it our way. Right up the road, left at the side. Your way, my way, one at a time. It's theology the way you want it. So it's going to be Burger King theology. Pray that my chin doesn't look too bad, you know, because you can see my chinny chin chin. I look much younger, don't I? I have a, like a baby face. I don't know if that's good because people don't like baby face. Raphael, I really don't care how many verses a Jehovah's Witness uses against you. If I have a topic, they can use 10,000 verses against you. What does that got to do with the topic, Raphael? Why don't you bring also verses that Mormons use against you or, or Muslims use against you or atheists use against you? So let's forget the topic. Okay, hold on. Thank you, brother. I love you, Raphael, but not too much, obviously. You had gotten me excited. All right. Let me get rid of another dog. Man, these guys. But then now you just rained on my parade. It's okay. You rain again on my parade. Run away. We're just waiting a few more minutes. Right? Just a few more minutes. We'll wait for the people to come in. You know what really disturbs me as well? You have so many chiefs, not enough Indians, who think they know scripture and they don't, and they twist it to their shame and destruction, and they're trying to correct you. It's it's unbelievable, man. The the age we live in. It's unbelievable, but it's okay. All right. Thank you. Pray in Jesus' name. I keep looking better healthier but holier which more important to the lord jesus christ we be holy unto the lord jesus christ Yehovah, Father, Son, and spirit okay we're almost there 1611 on your way to heaven all right good to see you brother thank you abraham one thing i want to help you with help me to help you so i can be a blessing and not a stumbling block to you and not anger the lord jesus christ number one Try to focus on the topic at hand. Number one, try to focus on the topic at hand. So do not ask me questions that are not related to the topic. You may think ask me questions about Joseph's witnesses is related to the topic. It's not because the topic is to refute that Jesus is this spirit creature called Archangel Michael. Number two, do not get into side debates or side discussions in the comment section. Here's why. This is not the time to come and preach, teach, and debate because you're going to distract others. There are people here who want to listen and focus, but when you get into side discussions, side debates, you become a distraction, right? So please keep those two things in mind, and then we'll all be blessed, walk away, edified for the glory of Jesus Christ, not upset, not sinning in our hearts, not bringing div division and grieving the Holy Spirit. And do hit the like button. Hopefully, we'll get the regulars here by the grace of God. Tomorrow, September 11, Lord Jesus willing, what I want to do is a topic related to Christianity and Islam because of September 11. I'm thinking that I'm going to do a discussion tomorrow, Lord Jesus willing, a discussion tomorrow on Jesus prophesying the coming of Muhammad and turn this objection against the Muslims to make them regret, make them regret the day that they decide to use the gospels to prove that jesus 
<clears throat> predict the coming of Muhammad. So God willing, if you guys are up for it, tomorrow in memory of all those who were murdered by Muhammad's jihadi thugs, uh, September 11, I'll do a topic. Did Jesus prophesy Muhammad in the Gospel of John? What do you guys think? You guys up for that? Tomorrow? Same bat time, same bat channel? Satan's attacking. So, okay, folks, we're about to begin in a few minutes. So I got some prayer requests. Do pray for our sister, Zarina Blanchard. She mentioned in the comment section, so it's not private. I guess she's going to have a valve. Maybe you can be specific, sister, what your situation is. She's going to go for surgery for her heart. So please pray for Zarina. That the Holy Spirit will fill her with peace, love, comfort, and that the surgery will be successful. And that the Lord Jesus will guide the surgeons to do a perfect job. Job It is Zarina Blanchard, mitral valve repair. Pray. She's a little nervous. I don't blame her. But pray that the Holy Spirit will fill her. And it will be a successful surgery in Jesus' name so that she can then join us again. Join us again. And worship Jesus with us. So pray for our sister Zarina. Pray for me and my daughters in Jesus' name. I haven't seen my angels. I'm trusting the Lord Jesus to fight this battle, that they'll be in my life again, and I can be their Baba and show them Jesus. Pray for that, that we are inseparable, and he'll bring them to me. I just have to be patient. <sighs> patient. Pray, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue to speak clearly. This is the, the word I've been receiving from the men of God and the women of God independently. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, right, a case will be settled right two or three witnesses for the past two years this is what the lord jesus has been <clears throat> speaking to me through the body of believers okay he's been giving me exodus 14 14 jehovah fights for you hold your peace you don't know how many people have given me that verse exodus 14 14 independently from one another jehovah fights for you hold your peace i've also been told I've also been told because I've asked God to speak to me clearly and give me a sign, a breadcrumb. And what I've been receiving over and over again, Jehovah says, be patient. Be still, be patient and know I am God. Be patient. He's been telling me this over and over again because I've asked for specific signs regarding specific issues. And all I've heard for the past two years, Jehovah fights for you. Hold your peace. Be still, be patient, know I am God. In other words, God is saying, you will get your answer in the appointed time. You just have to be patient. And I'm asking God for miraculous deliverance from this corrupt, wicked, evil judge, this demon of Satan, that the Lord will deliver me from this <clears throat> burden she put on me. Now, if it's a burden that I deserve to pay, I, I would have no problem, but it's not. So I'm going to be very open with you as my family, and I'm going to have people slandering me. I don't care. The Lord rebuke you if you use this against me. You know. This corrupt, wicked judge who is known to destroy men has ordered me to pay the legal fees of my ex-wife, right? And she expects me to pay 40000 that I did not accrue. Oh, yeah, and another passage given to me. Lopez just gave it to me, Isaiah 54, 17. So pray within these 60 days that the Lord destroys this wicked, unjust decision to pay <clears throat> the amount of money that I did not accrue, but my ex did because of her adultery. So pray for deliverance there, conviction leading to her repentance and protection for my children, all right? Yeah, wicked, wicked, evil judge in Jesus' name. And I, God has also been sharing with me Isaiah 54, 17, as Lopez just, just shared. So pray for that. Pray that I can get my health back. Pray that I become radically holy and passionate in love with Jesus Christ. And pray the Lord will allow me to relocate. I need to leave Illinois. And that he'll open the door for me to leave by October, if he's pleased, to start a new chapter in a new state away from this evil place that has pretty much destroyed me and my family. So pray for that in Jesus' name. Uh, Abdul Rahman, you pretend to be someone who's open to the truth, and I will decimate your filthy, wicked prophet, the son of Satan. So don't come here pretending to be something you're not. You're a joke like your religion is. Anyway, pray for that in Jesus' name. 
And also I've been praying, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've been praying specifically for a particular person if it's God's will. I'm praying specifically for a specific person if it's God's will. And even then, yes, do you, you believe this son of Satan? The same Bible that says, do not give what is sacred to dogs or cast pearl before swine. So don't just quote one verse out of context. You're a dog and a swine like your prophet. Stop going after it. I'll muzzle you. Okay. And even then, God, God hasn't given me a clear answer, but he's told me, be patient, even with this particular person. So pray the Lord will make it clear to me in Jesus' name. So these are some prayer requests I need you to pray for. Admins, are you here? Muzzle any rabid dogs who want to distract from the topic at hand. So I need prayers on that. So I'm waiting for the Lord to give me answers on these in these areas in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lopez. I receive it. I receive it in Jesus' name. All right. Yeah. No, no, actually, Abdurrahman, my ex-wife didn't marry a Muslim man because though she committed adultery, she wouldn't stoop to the level of marrying a dog. She saw the life of your prophet who lusted after his son's wife and his God forced his son to divorce his wife so that your filthy prophet could then... <clears throat> have sex with her, committing incest and adultery. And then to make it even worse, your filthy God then abolished adoption in order to spare your prophet from the humiliation of lusting for his son's wife. So you follow a filthy dog and worship a demon. May God erase Muhammad from under the sun in Jesus' name. And then your prophet prostituted women like your mother and sister and daughter, calling it Zawaj al -Muta. Abdurrahman, if someone came to you and said, I want to marry your mother for three days, your father's dead, but I want to marry your mother for three days and then pay her money and divorce her, what would you call that? You would call that prostitution, but your filthy prophet prostituted women, treated them as whores and called it muta. So that means your prophet was one of the first pimps known to mankind. See? So keep talking and watch how I decimate your prophet and humiliate him and your God. By the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, so guys, this guy don't know me too well. He thinks I'm going to be politically correct. And all he can do is laugh. Oh, my goodness. That's all he can do. Hold on. We're about to begin, folks. This all this, this guy can do is laugh. The fact that his prophet treated women like whores and prostitutes. All right, either. Can you believe that? Oh, by the way, by the way, I forgot to mention, over the weekend, I did 30 pre-recorded shows for the satellite station Al-Fadi TV. 30 pre-recorded shows. And all I can say is that the Holy Spirit filled us. It was an amazing, supernatural anointing from the Holy Spirit filled with wisdom and knowledge and passion from the Spirit. These 30 shows are going to be amazing by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll, they'll be airing soon on Al Fadi TV. So look for Al Fadi TV, A L F A D Y. And they'll be appearing soon. Glory to Jesus Christ for another door, an open door, being used by Christ to glorify his name and expose this wicked, filthy agent of Satan called Muhammad. All right. All right. With that said, are we ready to begin? No, it's not Al Fadi Zarina. See, you guys are not paying attention. I love you guys. Yep, I am a Syrian. I am Jilu. I am a Syrian. Zarina, I love you, sister. And I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. But one thing about Christians, we don't pay attention. I didn't say Al Fadi, the Christian. I said Al Fadi TV. So I didn't know that Al Fadi, our brother, is a television set. Oh, my goodness. You guys are killing me. Yeah, there were like 30-minute episodes, Abraham. 30-minute episodes. I'm not talking about our brother in Christ, Al-Fadi. His YouTube channel is Sira, C-I-R-A. I even made it clear. Al-Fadi TV, A-L-F-A-D-Y. You guys are killing me. <laughs> oh, you Christians are going to kill me. Okay, are we ready? 
يب الفادي تي في Are we ready to begin? Sorry for those of you who are waiting for these distractions, but we have to wait a few minutes until the regulars show up. <clears throat> so just want to ask the Lord to bless. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I ask that you cover us with the blood of Jesus and wash us in the blood of Jesus and sanctify us by your spirit and forgive us, Father. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Holy Spirit, forgive us for our shortcomings, for our flesh. Crucify our flesh and save us from our flesh. Save me from my flesh, Father. And Father, fill us with power and wisdom, knowledge from your spirit. And give us power from your spirit to live for your glory, Father. For the glory of Jesus, your son, in the power of your Holy Spirit, to obey you and to love you and to proclaim your word and live your word and even be willing to die for your word if necessary, Father. We need you. Energize me, Father. Fill me with life and, and passion from your spirit, Lord. And save me from being unnecessarily offensive and bless your household, your church. Grant everyone here wisdom and knowledge from your spirit to understand these things and use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. And save us from attacks of the enemy, Father. You know our needs, Father. Please help us and meet our needs because we depend on you. We trust in you. We cleave to you. And please, Father, be with my daughters and wash them blood of Jesus Christ and remind them that I love them, Father. And bring them to me for your glory. Father, we love you. We love the Lord Jesus, your son. We love your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. And thank Protestant believer. He'll be posting verses. But even before I begin, I forgot to mention, I want to thank all of you who are not only praying for me, but partnering with me financially to keep me doing full-time ministry. Pray for more supporters. I need more to keep doing this for the glory of Jesus Christ, that he meets my needs for the sake of my children. We don't do it to get rich. We do it to glorify Christ. And I've noticed that one or two individuals edited their pledge on Patreon. And I hope they did so because they weren't upset, but maybe <clears throat> they're not able to contribute as much. If so, God bless you. Any, any amount counts. But at the same time, I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. And at the same time, I don't want to tickle ears for money. May the Lord protect us and purify us. Not to do it for money, not to compromise, but not to be unnecessarily offensive. All right? I never want to sell myself for money. In Jesus' name, may that never happen. May the Lord Jesus protect me from that. And at the same time, I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. We're not doing it for money. We're not. We're doing it for the glory of Christ. I can tell you, David Wood is not doing it for money. Jay Smith is not doing it for money. Anthony Rogers is not doing it for money. And I'm telling you, I'm not doing it for money. I want to do this because I feel compelled by the Spirit to serve Jesus in ministry till I die, even though the Lord Jesus doesn't need me. And even though if I had a choice, honestly, if I had a choice, I would disappear from the limelight and just serve Jesus Christ in some place where people don't know me, right? But anyway, this will be done. I feel compelled to do this, and as long as he compels me, his will be done. And I mean that. And I pray the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue to speak clearly without error for his glory. So with that said, let's continue demonstrating that Jesus Christ is not the spirit creature called Michael. And I'm going to continue unpacking Hebrews chapter 1. Thank you, guys. Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to... Go throughout the entire chapter because Hebrews 1 is one of the most powerful refutations of the Jehovah Witness lie, of the Aryan lie, modern-day Aryans, cultists like Greg Stafford, a cult leader, a perverter of scripture, that Jesus Christ is this creature called the Archangel Michael. If you know how to unpack Hebrews chapter 1, it is a nightmare to this position. Now, we left off explaining the word character. Do you remember that in Hebrews 1 verse 3? We explain what the word character means in Hebrews 1, verse 3. No, you won't. Don't ask me about, oh, by the way, another thing. You have some of these jokers, I don't want to call them clowns, who read the scriptures in a certain way where they think you can never remarry, and then they want to impose their misreading of the Bible upon you and then accuse you of praying for adultery if you want to remarry because they think there is no legitimate grounds for remarriage. For those of you who believe that, that's between you and God. 
If that's what you believe, that's between you and God. But do not impose it on others. And don't you dare accuse those who don't believe that the Bible says you cannot remarry for any circumstance of <clears throat> adultery. Because that's one what one stupid person did. And I have to say, one stupid idiot did in the comment section accused us of praying for adultery because of this idiot's misreading of the Bible. When you accuse the brethren of praying for adultery, then I'm going to call you stupid and an idiot, and I'm going to treat you like a fool. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5, specifically verse 5. Yep, that's what they did in the comment section. The idiot was stupid enough to say this in the comment section, saying that people are praying to commit adultery because they want to remarry because this individual thinks that even if your spouse commits adultery, you're still not free from the marital bound. If you believe that, that's between you and God. But shame on you for accusing Christians who don't see it that way, for encouraging or promoting adultery. Shame on you. You are a fool for accusing the brethren of adultery. Right? You want to believe that? That's between you and the Lord. There are people who believe that. But to accuse others who don't agree with your interpretation of Scripture of encouraging, promoting adultery, shame on you. That's why I'm going to treat you as an idiot, as a fool, as someone stupid. And I'm using biblical language, by the way. Right? I'm using biblical language. You don't believe me? Proverbs 26, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 8. Jeremiah 10, verse 14. Where God, through his prophets, calls people stupid, idiots, fools. Okay? Just want, to, just want to say that. Are we ready now? Now let's focus on Scripture. So I think we have another fool, another idiot here, trying to misquote 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11. Not realizing that I'm going to muzzle this fool in a minute. Zam Zibom. You need to leave. Hold on. Starting off very angry, aren't we? Okay. Yep, it's the same fool. Yeah, good to see you first class. Let's begin in Jesus' name. Sorry about that. Sorry for distraction, guys. This is the nature of a live stream. You're going to get distracted. You're going to have to engage fools, idiots, and even sons of Satan and dogs who want to blaspheme or attack and cause division. And you got to muzzle them by the grace of God. You guys excited? Yeehaw! All right, we broke down Hebrews 1 3. Let's continue. Hebrews 1 3. Let's continue. Hebrews 1 verses 4 and 5. Hebrews 1 verses 4 and 5. Are you guys ready? Pray God energizes me because it's been a long weekend. 30 pre recorded shows, and I'm tired and I'm feeling it. So, Hebrews 1 4, 4 to 5. Okay, Hebrews 1 verses 4 and 5. Let's read. So he has become better. Read with me, folks. Read with me. So he has become better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs. For example, to which one of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. And again, I will become his father, he'll become my son. Now, guys, are you ready to go into the meat? By the grace of Jesus Christ, you ready for some meat? Are you ready for meat? As the Lord loosens my tongue, anoints my mouth to speak only truth for the glory of Jesus with the passion from the Holy Spirit. It says in Hebrews 1.4, Hebrews 1.4, pay attention. Christ has become better than the angels and has inherited a name that's superior to theirs. Wait, let's read that again. Hebrews 1.4. Let's look at it again. Yep, here we go. Hater Wood, drinking that hater aid. He's the angel of death. When he shows up, it's inevitable that he puts people not to sleep, but causes them to die prematurely. But anyway, Hebrews 1 verse 4. He's a cure of insomnia, and he's caused more people to die prematurely with his boring videos. Boring. All right, Hebrews 1 verse 4. Hater Wood in the hizzy. Hebrews 1, 4, folks, let's read. 
So he, Jesus, has become better than the angels. Wait, folks. Jesus is God in nature. Jesus is God in nature. He's already infinitely better, superior to angels. How then can Jesus Christ become better than the angels? Hebrews 1, verse 4. Let's unpack this, folks. Hebrews 1, verse 4. So he's become better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs. Okay. Understand the implication of what you just read. When Christ died and then rose again and then ascended to sit at the right hand of God, ascending into heaven to sit in throne at God's right hand is when he became better than the angels. Jesus became better than the angels when he physically rose from the dead and ascended into heaven to sit at God's right hand. But Jesus is God, and as God, he's already infinitely better than the angels. So how could Paul, or the author of Hebrews, if you don't Paul wrote it, if you don't believe Paul wrote it, say that Jesus became better than the angels? Can someone help me? Understand? Let's focus on this. It says he became better, do how we. You're not paying attention. He became better after he went to heaven. How can he become better than them? Anyone want an answer? And then he inherited a name that's superior to theirs. Let's look at it again. Hebrews 1, verse 4. One more time. See, now I got your attention because you guys are silent. Watch here. So he has become better than the angels to the extent that he's inherited a name more excellent than theirs. So he has a name that's more excellent than theirs, and he became better than them. When did he become better than them? When he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. But 1611, he still has a human nature in heaven. So does that make him inferior to them? 1611 says he took on human nature. Wait, he still has a human nature in heaven. Does that mean he's inferior to them? What does the resurrected body have to do with anything? He still has a physical body now glorified and a human nature in heaven. So if taking on human nature, nature made him less than them, then he's still less than them because he's still human. He's still less than them because he's still human. Let's go to Hebrews 2, 5 to 9 for the answer. Hebrews 2, 5 to 9 for the answer. Saying he has a glorified body doesn't explain to me why he was less than them and had to become better than them. How could Jesus be less than the angels when by nature he's better than them? Hebrews 2, 5 to 9. But he's still your Savior now, Rick, in heaven. So if being the Savior made him less than them, he's still your Savior. So is he still less than them? Okay, let's read. Here's the answer. Hebrews 2, 5 to 9. Here's the answer. For it is not to the angels that he subjected the inhabited earth to come. Read with me. Here's the answer. God is speaking through the author Letting believers know the world to come, the age to come, the new heavens and the earth will not be subjected to angels. For it is not to angels that he subjected the inhabited earth to come. The new heavens and earth won't be subject to angels about which we are speaking. But in one place, a certain witness said, what is man that you keep in him in mind or a son of man that you take care of him? Now he's quoting Psalm chapter 8. Verses 4 to 6. He's quoting Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> but in one place, a certain witness said, What is man that you keep him in mind, or a son of man that you take care of him? Now notice 7 to 8. You made him a little lower than angels. Notice, you took mankind, you took human beings, you took man in general, and made mankind a little lower than angels. Notice Hebrews 2.7. You made him a little lower than angels 
You crowning him, you crowned him with glory and honor and appointed him over the works of your hands. All things you subjected under his feet. You sub subjected the entire physical creation to man. You made man ruler over the physical creation and you made mankind little lower than the angels. All things you subjected under his feet. But notice what 8 says. <clears throat> By subjecting all things to him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Now, though, we do not see all things in subjection to him. Okay. You don't need to post Psalm 8, 4 to 6, brother, but it's okay. I need verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels, now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death, so that by God's undeserved kindness, he might taste death for everyone. Okay, did everyone read these passages? <clears throat> did everyone read them? All of you focused on them? I guess Lopez, our brother, needs attention here. Can someone give him attention? He wants to talk about Elohim in Psalm 8 and then two natures of Christ. Idiota, I give Lopez attention. Okay, everyone following me here? Do you understand what you just read? Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6, talks about mankind, human beings in general, being made a little lower than angels and given the right to rule over the physical creation. Right? Did you understand the point of the author? That God appointed mankind, right, to have dominion over physical creation, and yet mankind is a little lower than the angels. Everyone with me there? Before I move on, because if you don't get it, I can't move on. But then he says, we don't see the physical earth, the creation subject to man. Why? Because we have rebellious spirit creatures, rebellious angelic beings who are ruling the earth and oppressing man and suppressing man, right? R ruling in tyranny, oppressing the righteous, suppressing the righteous, misleading mankind. Bringing about misery, pain, and suffering, right? So we don't see the physical earth in subjection to mankind. Is that with me there? So then how can it be said God has made mankind a little lower than angels and subjected the earth to man when we see that the earth is not under the control of mankind, but spirit rulers, rebellious spirit creatures who terrorize man, tyrannize man, oppress man, suppress man, corrupt man, bring misery, suffering, and mislead man from the true God. Do you understand his point? Do you understand what he's saying? Before I move on, I'm going to take a lot of time unpacking this. A lot of time to unpacking this because there's a lot of meat in Hebrews 1 and 2. Okay. Now let's look at Hebrews 2, 8 to 9 one more time. Hebrews 2, verses 8 to 9 one more time. Because I'm going to explain what the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate. And early church tradition says that this was written by Paul, perhaps using Luke as a scribe. Hebrews 2, 8 to 9. All things you subjected under his feet, the feet of mankind. By subjecting all things to him, God left nothing that is not subject, subject to him, meaning mankind. This is a collective singular. It's not referring to one individual, but to mankind collectively. But now notice what it says. Now, though, we do not yet see all things in subjection to him. We don't see the earth subject to man. But then he gives you... <clears throat> The hope 
of what's to come. He gives you hope for what's to come. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little, little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death, so that by God's undeserved kindness, he might test, taste death for everyone. Now let's put Hebrews 1.4 and Hebrews 2.9 back to back. Hebrews 1.4 and Hebrews 2.9 back to back. I'm going to go into a lot of meat by the power of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus and bless you. But you got to be patient and you got to focus and not get distracted. Hebrews 1.4 and 2.9 back to back. We don't distinguish the human Jesus from the divine Jesus, medic. Jesus is one person who is God and man. Hebrews 1.4 and 2.9. So he, Jesus, has become better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs. Now compare it to verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death. Now notice what it's saying. Part of the price that Jesus had to pay to save you was to become a flesh and blood human being and come to the earth. But in so doing, he had to assume our fallen status. Part of the price that Jesus paid included him taking on the status of fallen human beings, a status that would make him lower than the angels in position. You with me there? Because of the rebellion, disobedience of Adam and Eve, mankind is now lower than the angels in glory and status and now have evil ru spirit rulers ruling over the earth. So part of the price that Jesus paid to redeem us is that he had to become flesh and blood and take on our status. He had to assume the status of fallen human beings, a status that would make him lower than the angels in position. So in his infinite love, he took your status voluntarily. He made himself lower than the angels that he created in position. Exactly, Shirley. Are you with me there? You understand what he did? You understand what he did? Why are you making a distinction between the human Jesus and the son medic? The son is Jesus. Jesus is the son and he's the God man. We don't make that distinction because you're almost... Creating two distinct persons. Stop it and focus. Okay. By becoming man, Jesus, the divine son, took on the status of fallen human beings. So on earth, he took on our fallen status. He didn't take our fallen nature because as a man, he was sinless. So he didn't take on a sinful human nature. He took on a human nature that was free of sin. But he took on the status and position of fallen mankind, a position that made him lower than the angels in status. Exactly, Lopez. Is everyone with me? Because I got to go real slow. Yep. His nature was like Adam and Eve before they sinned. Adam and Eve had a human nature that was sinless, and they corrupted that human nature by disobeying God. So Jesus took on the human nature that Adam had when he was created before he fell. Everyone with me here? You see how slow I'm going with this, right? You asked for it. I, it may not be entertaining, but it's educational because I want to be careful Trusting the Spirit to enable me to interpret Scripture correctly so you can fall more passionately in love with the God of this book. Yes, Franz Toma, you can say that. And I'm going to get there, Franz Toma. I'm going to make the case.
No 1611. Adam was not lower than the angels. He was higher than the angels, the crown of God's creation. See, you guys are thinking, praise God. Franz Thoma in 1611 got it. But Adam became lower than the angels because of his sin and rebellion. So what did Jesus do? Pay the debt of sin in order to restore us to the glory we lost in Adam. Which is why now Christ, as our representative, not just as God, but as the God man, as our representative, elevated human nature above the angels. So because of Christ, we are now higher than the angels because of him. Taking our nature, representing us, and exalting, exalting human nature above the angels once more. You catch it? I don't know, Duhawi, what you mean that Jesus did not take on human nature. He did. You with me there? You understand what happened here? You understand what's happening here? By becoming flesh and retaining his human nature and physical body after the resurrection, follow with me, please. I want you to get it. After the resurrection, by retaining his human nature and then glorifying his physical body, he not only went back to heaven as God, he went back as the God-man. So when Jesus returned to his exalt exalted status, he didn't simply return there as God. He did so as God who was now man. And so he now elevated humanity, elevated human nature to a status higher than angels. Yes, JL, that's the reason why it says we will judge angels because we are greater than them because of Jesus. Is everyone with me? Are you, are you following with me? You understand? That's right. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 to 3, 3 says we judge angels. Because of Christ, we are now exalted to the status we enjoyed before the fall, a status that made us higher than the angels. So why was Jesus lower than the angels? Because in his love, he voluntarily assumed our fallen status in order to then elevate our status above the angels once again. I'm letting it sink in before I move on to the next point. Are you getting this? You're getting it, right? So, part of the price Jesus paid to redeem us was to assume our fallen status, where for a season he becomes lower than the angels that he created, in order to then elevate our status humanity above the angels after his resurrection ascension into heaven a status that adam and eve had but they lost because of their sin exactly france toma that's the reaction i wanted you to have when you understand the bible clearly by the power of the holy spirit notice what france toma said that's the reaction prompted by the spirit when the spirit helps us understand his word Man, look how much Jesus loves us. He did everything for us to bring us back. We have a great God. Amen. That's the reaction. And did you know that now in Christ, even in this fallen sinful body, in this world, I am greater than angels and angels are my servants if I'm in Christ? Did you know that? If I belong to Jesus and I'm one with him in the spirit, now, not future, I am greater than angels. Angels are my servants. You don't believe me? Hebrews 1.14. Hebrews 1.14. Hebrews 1.14. Here. Hebrews says it, not me. Are they not all spirits for holy service? Sent to minister for those who are going to inherit salvation. Read it. Are they not all spirits, meaning these angelic creatures, for holy service? 
sent out to minister for those who are going to inherit salvation. Angels are your ministers because of Jesus. If you are an inheritor of salvation because of faith in Christ, Michael and Gabriel serve you. No, Middle East for Christ. Don't blaspheme the Lord by saying he was attracted to pretty woman. Muzzle your mouth and never insult the Lord. You with me there? Did you understand what you just read? So, do you understand that you just read? Angels are spirits who minister for those who inherit salvation. Salvation that Jesus has purchased for us. Hebrews 5, 9. Hebrews 5, 9. Let's look at it. I'm going slow here. Hope I'm not boring you because I'm going slow. Hebrews 5, verse 9. Hebrews 5, verse 9. And after he had been made perfect, he became responsible. Protestant, are you quoting the King James? Doesn't sound like the King James. Go back to the King James. It sounds like the King James, dude. You're throwing me off. Hebrews 5, 9. So, does sound like the King James. And being made perfect, he became the author of... Of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You see? Author, I didn't like, became responsible. Who's the author of our salvation that never ends? A salvation that results in never ending, incorruptible life? Jesus, right? So when you trust in him and obey him, he gives you eternal redemption, a redemption that lasts forever. So if you inherit salvation because of your trust in Christ, angels are now commanded by Christ to serve you, his body, the church, born of the spirit. You with me there? Did you get it? Hebrews 1, 3. Lopez, you're about the 10th million person who's confirmed I need to write a book. I'm not lying. From the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? About 10 million people have told me write a book. So I guess God is telling me write a book. So pray that the Lord will take me out of this trial of from this corrupt, evil, satanic judge so I can be free to do it. Okay. Why are you going to Hebrews 1, brother? Did I say Hebrews 1? I'm sorry. Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 1 3. Sorry, Protestant. Ephesians 1 3. Follow with me. I may take the entire session breaking this down. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing imaginable, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Do you see it? Because Christ has gone into heaven representing you. Because he's still man representing us. He's now procured all spiritual blessings for us. All of them. All of them. Now get ready to read with me Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Guys, you really have to read Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. You're not going to get it. So please read it with me. I want you to get it. Okay, Ephesians 1, 19 and 23. And what is the exceeding greatness, read here, of his power to us word. God demonstrates his power and uses his power for us, for our benefit, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. And he showed us what this power is like. God's power is infinite. Because it's that power that raised Jesus to become immortal, never to die again. 
Now, what kind of power is this that can take a dead man and raise that man physically to never die again, making him physically indestructible? What an amazing power. And that's the power he uses to save us. Which he wrought, which he demonstrated, which he used in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him. Notice the power. Set Christ at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above. Jesus is now far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name. Christ is far above every name. That is name, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things. Notice, remember we read Hebrews 2, where Psalm said, God put all things under the feet of man. Notice in Ephesians 1.22, God the Father <clears throat> has put all things under the feet of Jesus. And gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the church. To the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Let's look at Ephesians 1.22 one more time. Understand what Paul is saying. Let's understand what Paul is saying. And hath put all things under the feet of Jesus. And gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the church. You know what that means to the church? Jesus has become head over everything for the sake of the church. Christ in representing us, being one of us, a man with our human nature, is the head over everything for the sake of the church. Because everything is subject to Christ, he now makes everything subject to us because of it. Lytle, Jesus was given what he already has, but he's also exercising his power over creation as a man representing us. So it's not simply Jesus regaining what was his, but now exercising his sovereignty as a man for our benefit, guaranteeing that we too will be sovereign over all things subject only to the Godhead, subject only to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible is teaching. You understand what the Bible is teaching? The Bible is teaching that Christ became one of us to represent us, to exalt us over every created thing, subject only to Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The only one that we'll be subject to beneath forever and ever is the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything else is beneath our feet, even the angels. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Only Father, Son, Holy Spirit, only the Trinity, only the Godhead will be above us. Ephesians 2, 1, 6. And hath raised us. God has raised us who are born of the Spirit, united to Christ. Already, right now, has raised us. And right now, we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you catch it? Paul didn't say in the future. He goes, right now, if you're alive by the Spirit, right now, you are united to Christ. And right now, in position, you're sitting with Christ above all things. Right now. Do you catch it? Ephesians 2, 6. Are you catching it? Ephesians 2, 6. He's talking about those who are dead, who are now alive by the grace of God and one with Christ in the spirit. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 6 one more time. And hath raised us already, not future, right now, present reality. Has raised us up together and made us sit together, not future. Right now you're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Your position has now been exalted to heaven because Christ, your head, your representative, who's one of us, represents you on the throne and has exalted you on the throne right now.
right? Douglas, you better not change the subject because you know you're going to get blocked. You ain't there? So the only being that will be greater than us, higher than us, who will be subject to forever and ever is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because God is not a creature. Did you get it? I want it to sink in before I move on. Did you understand what you just read? So Jesus, for a season, was lower than the angels. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, mankind lost their glory and position has become lower than the angels. And because of man's rebellion, you have evil spirit beings ruling the earth in tyranny and evil oppressing, suppressing human beings, making their lives miserable and misleading them from the truth. So Jesus, in his love, came to the earth to share our status, becoming lower than the angels, in order to then elevate our status once again above the angels for all those who believe in him. Send prodigy on his merry way, this Mormon heretic, son of Satan. Ban him. Did you catch what Jesus did? He did everything for us. He did everything for you and me. Everything God could possibly do, he did. He even allowed himself to take on a status, making him lower than his own creatures, to be humiliated, to be beaten by wicked, filthy, sinful hands, whipped to the point of death, nailed to a cross, spit on, he did all this in order to then elevate us higher than the angels. You catch it? Exactly. No religion teaches this. And it's true because Jesus really walked this earth. There was really a Jesus of Nazareth and he, he is alive. And he loves us more than we can imagine. We will see him. Before I move on, I want to make sure everyone's getting it. Now, how does this prove that Jesus can't be the Archangel Michael? Are you ready? How does this prove that Jesus can't be the Archangel Michael? Let's look at Hebrews 1, 4, chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 2, verse 5, and chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 2, verse 5, chapter 2, verse 9. Let's look. Let's read together, folks. Read with me. How does this prove that Jesus can't be a created spirit? being named Michael. No, not because of that, bra, bra. So that doesn't work. Hebrews 1, 4, not 14. Protestant, what's up, bro? You're losing it, man. I didn't say 14. I said 1, 4, 2, 5, and 9. Okay. Watch here. Hebrews 1, 4, 2, verse 5, and 2, 9. Being made so much better than the angels, he became better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So he's now better than the angels. Hebrews 2 5. For it is not to angels that he subjected the inhabited earth to come. So the earth to come, that earth to come is not subjected to any angel. Jesus is now better than the angels. Hebrews 2 9. But we do see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death. So that by God's undeserved kindness, he might taste death for everyone. Now, understand what author of Hebrews is saying. The world to come won't be subject to angels. It'll be subject to us. 
What's the guarantee that the earth to come will be subject to us, not to angels? Jesus has been crowned with glory and honor after suffering death. And he's now better than the angels as our representative representing us and guaranteeing that the earth to come will be subject to us, not to angels. This would not make sense if Jesus is an angel. Because number one, if Jesus is an angel, then the earth is still subject to an angel. How does this then prove to us that the world to come won't be subject to angels but to humans if Jesus is an angel? Number two, how can Jesus be superior to angels if he is an angel? How could Jesus become better than angels if he's an angel? Does that even make sense? Does that make sense? He's become better than the angels as a guarantee that we who believe in him will be better than the angels as a guarantee that the earth to come won't be subject to angels but to humans. And the proof is that Jesus, who represents us, is better than angels and the earth is subject to him. But hold on. If Jesus is an angel, then the earth to come is subject to an angel. And how can he be better than angels when he is an angel also? Do you see why Hebrews 1 is an annihilation, a de decimation of heretics, cultists, cult leaders, sons of Satan, like Greg Stafford, who believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael? The word in Greek is the same as in English. It's become. Don't get into the Greek and try to sound fancy. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss. Kiss. K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay, are you with me there? The Metatron is actually your uncle. He's your mother's brother. Look at the stuff that they're coming up with. Metatron and Enoch. Dude, my goodness. He's your uncle, Bri Bra. When you see him, say hi. Douglas, I'm, you know I got to send you on your merry way, right? See you later, buddy. Take care, friend. Don't come back to the channel. Hold on. Okay. No, Jesus is not the Metatron. Stop bringing... Brother Boss, you bring up another relevant issue, you're going to be sent on your merry way. All right. You guys with me here? Don't worry about it, Medic for Christ. See, this is, again, Medic for Christ. Why are you allowing an agent of Satan to distract you? You see why now I block people and silence them? Metatron is your is your uncle, Medic, Medic for Christ. He's your mother's brother. When you see him, say hi to him. You see, again, you're allowing the children of Satan to distract you. You see why I get frustrated and I block people and ban them? Because this is Satan's way of getting you to be distracted. See, Shirley got distracted. Instead of focusing, Shirley had to go find out on Google, which means Satan won because she got distracted. Right? Why do you allow the devil to distract you guys where you lose out? Am I wasting my time? If you're that easily distracted, I'm wasting my time. This will be the last time I'll do this. Because now you're disrespecting my time. You get what I'm saying? I am going to be a stern teacher. Because you guys have surrounded yourself with teachers who are effeminate will tickle your ears. I'm not going to do that. Okay, now coming back to the issue. Surely, why don't you Google also Enoch, right, and Yahuwah while you're doing it. Go Google their names too. Okay, now coming back to the issue. Did you understand if Jesus is better than the angels, okay, and Jesus' exaltation of the angels is the guarantee and proof that God is giving us that the earth to come won't be subject to angels but humans, that means Jesus can't be an angel now, can he? Because if he's an angel, how can he be better than angels when he's one of them? And if he's an angel, 
How is that a guarantee that the earth to come will be subject to humans and not to angels? You understand the argument of the author of Hebrews? How much time did I take on this subject? Because I want to unpack Hebrews 1.5. How much time thus far? How much time? Yeah, send Elohim, Elohim on his merry way because he's one of those following Elohim. Okay, let's do Hebrews 1.5 now. Let's do Hebrews 1.5. Notice all the sons of Satan manifesting all the demons. Hebrews 1.5. Let's unpack Hebrews 1.5. Okay. Let's look at Hebrews 1.5. Now I need your attention. Notice the rhetorical question. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. It's a rhetorical question. Did God ever say to an angel, You are my son, today I've become your father? No. But Hebrews 1.5 says that God said it to Jesus. God said to Jesus, You are my son, today I've begotten you. And I will be to my father. He shall be to me a son. Right? God said it to Jesus. But folks, guess what though? Guess what? Angels are called the sons of God. Angels are called the sons of God. Let's go to Job 38 verses 4 to 7. Job 38 verses 4 to 7. Angels are called the sons of God. Job 38, verses 4 to 7. Yes, they are. What do you mean never? They're called the sons of God. Here you go, right here. Job 38, verses 4 to 7. Watch. We're going to read it together. I have to do say in all humbleness. In all humbleness, I am one handsome human being. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm being humble when I say that. Job 38, 4 to 7. Let's read. Where was thou? God is speaking to Job. He's saying, Job, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Do you know? Or hath stretched the line upon it? Now watch. Read. Okay. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Do you know the foundation of the earth? That the earth is fa fashioned to what foundation? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Let's put verse 7 one more time. No, Bill Thompson, not so much that. You're right, Bill Thompson. He was lesser than the angels, now better than the angels, but add the other argument. And the earth to come will be subject to humans, not to angels. And Jesus is proof the earth to come will be subject to humans, not to angels. Because the earth is subject to him. Well, how can it be subject to him? As a proof that the earth to come will be given to humans, not to angels, if Jesus is an angel. Okay, now Job 38, verse 7. So complete the argument, Bill Thompson. It's not just he's better than the angels and lower than the angels. He's the proof that the world to come will be subject to humans, not to angels. Well, if he's an angel and the earth is subject to him, what proof is that? Okay, Job 38, verse 7. Job 38, verse 7. One more time. Can you guys send Elohim on his merry way? Come on, admins. First, last. Come on, man. Get rid of the guy. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shout, shouted for jo joy. Now notice. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. God is telling Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth, the sons of God rejoiced. There were no human beings. No human beings when God laid the foundation of the earth. Humans were created after the earth was created. So who are these sons of God that were there when God laid the foundation of the earth? Who? Who were the sons of God that rejoiced seeing God create the earth when there were no humans yet? 
Okay, but wait, angels, right? So angels are called the sons of God. But I thought God never said to any angel, you are my son and I'm your father. Oh, we got a contradiction. Hebrews 1.5 says, God never said to any angel, you are my son. Today I become your father. I will be a father to you. You'll be a son to me. Do we have a contradiction? You see why I want to unpack this? Yep, Charles Dickens, that too. No contradiction. Do you know why? Guys, this is where I'm going to need your at attention. Do you really want to learn? Do you really want to go in depth in scripture? Or do you want me to just stop there and give you surface? Okay, here's the difference. The Bible will use the phrase son of God in different senses. The word son of God and God as father has different meanings depending on the context. Are you are you with are you following me? I'm gonna have to now um, unpack the meat of scripture. There's a sense in which we're all sons of God, in that God is our creator who gives us life. So there's a sense in which everything created is a child of God because God created us and gave us life. So there's a sense in which. God is our father in the sense that he's our life giver and sustainer. And we are his children because he created us, gave us life, and sustains us. Acts 17, 28. Acts 17, 28. Let me prove, prove it to you. Acts 17, 28. Watch here. Now I'm going to give you the different senses and meanings of the term father and son of God. Acts 17, 28. Paul talking to pagan Athenians, idolaters or not believers. Notice what he says to them. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, one of your Greek poets have said, for we are, we are also his offspring. Do you catch it? Because we live, move, and have our being in God, that makes God the father of us all and all of us his offspring. Do you catch it? Send Elohim on his merry way. Do you catch it? That means every human creature who's been given life by God, is a child of God. And God is their father in that he's their life giver and sustainer. Now, did God create all the angels? Did God create all the angels? So does God sustain angels and give them their life? Does God sustain angels and give them their life? So in that sense, all spirit creatures, every angel is a son of God, including the devil himself. If God created the devil and he's a spirit creature and God sustains the devil even now, that means God is the father to the devil and the devil is his offspring in that sense. Anyone, evildoer or righteous, a righteous spirit creature or an evil, unclean spirit creature. If he or she receives life from God, was made by God and sustained by God, is an offspring of God in that sense. You get it? Luke 3, 38. Luke 3, 38. Luke 3.38. Watch here. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam is the son of God. Why? Because God created him directly from the dust with his hands, metaphorically speaking. You could also assume visible form where you would see hands. 
breathed the breath of life in him, made him a living soul and sustained him. So Adam is a son of God in that sense. Right? Son of God also means, well, let me give you other verses. Are you ready? Isaiah 64, verse 8. Are you learning a lot? I'm hoping the Spirit will fill me with wisdom to teach you. Learn what the term father means and son of God means, daughter of God means. It has various meanings. Various meanings. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Watch here. Isaiah 64, verse 8. I don't know what happened to him. He, he got, uh, I guess Protestant left us behind. We're raptured. He's right. Okay. But now, O Yehovah, read this. Now, O Jehovah, thou art our father. We are the clay. Thou art potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. You see in what sense God is the father of Israel? He created Israel. He fashioned Israel. He made Israel. And in that sense, he's our father. Did you catch it? Jazer Lights, please don't help me by posting verses. Please, brother. Don't do it. Okay? Look at Isaiah 64, verse 8 one more time. But now, O Jehovah, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. See? You fashioned us, you created us, you made us. In that sense, you are our father. Isaiah 63, 16. Isaiah 63, 16. We got to get it over 150, guys. We're down 124. I'm set. Doubtless thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord Jehovah, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. He's our father in that he saves us, he protects us, he fights for us. He's our guardian. Like an earthly father who protects his offspring, God is our father who saves us, protects us, guards us. That's what redeem means. To redeem us from the hands of our enemy. To protect us. You see it? Malachi chapter 2 verse 10. Malachi chapter 2 verse 10. As an earthly father will say, protect and guard his offspring. Provide for his offspring. Right? Nourish, sustain his offspring. So is God our Father in that sense. Malachi 2.10. Malachi 2.10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Bam. Yes, and all glory to the triune God. I want you to see how real the Holy Spirit is. He gets the glory. All of this is from my memory. When I say my memory, as the Holy Spirit brings these passages to my mind, no notes. All glory to the Holy Spirit for that gift made perfected in me for the glory of Christ. Because Lopez said, super memory, bro. Malachi 2.10. Have ye not all one father? Hath not one God created us? So in what way is he our father? He created us, gives us life, sustains us, provides for us. Now, are you ready for me to ask you a question? Are you ready for me to ask you a question? Are you ready? Because I'm going to have to do a part two on this. Thank you, Michelle. Pray that he sustains me, fights for me, saves me from my trial, brings my daughters back and show me and confirm to me about this one person in mind, if it's his will, to make it known to me. Okay. Are you ready? If the term father in reference to God can mean the one who creates you, the one who made you, the one who sustains you, 
the one who provides for you, the one who nourishes you, and the one who protects you, isn't it true that in that sense, the Father is our Father, the Son is our Father, and the Holy Spirit is our Father? Because all three persons created us, made us, sustain us, give us life, redeem us, protect us, and guard us. So in one sense, even Jesus is our Father. In one sense, even the Holy Spirit is our Father. Even though the Son and the Spirit are not God the Father. You see why it's important to know sense, what's called sense and reference. You can use the same term with a different meaning and it can apply to all three. If by father I mean the one who creates me, made me, sustains me, provides for me, redeems me, guards me, protects me, then the father is my father in that sense. The son is my father in that sense. The Holy Spirit is my father in that sense without making the son and the spirit the same person as the father. Right? Exactly, Jesus Christ is Lord, everlasting Father. So there's another sense in which the term of Son of God is used. I don't know what you mean. You don't know Sam enough? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're talking about someone else. Forget about it. Don't be distracted by the children of Satan. There's another sense in which the term Son of God is used. Son of God means to share in the characteristics and nature of God. To reflect the nature of God. To share the nature of your father. Son of God, daughter of God means someone who shares the characteristics, the nature of God. Are you with me here? Can I prove that? Son of God, daughter of God, child of God means one who shares the nature of his or her parent. And therefore reflects the characteristics of his or her parent. Matthew 5, 9. Matthew 5, 9 to prove it. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Did you catch it? If you're a peacemaker, you're a child of God, because God is a God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So if you bring peace, you're a child of God because you're sharing that characteristic of God, your father. Right? Are you with me there? Yes, Bill Thompson. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Yep. Romans 16, 20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace. Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is said to be the Prince of Peace and our peace in Ephesians 2, 14. Okay, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Watch here. That ye may be the children of your father. Bam. Did you catch it? If you love your enemies and go do good to them, then you are children of your father, which is in heaven. Why? Because your father also does good to those who hate him, who are evil. For your father makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans, tax collectors do that? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. you catch it? you got to love your enemies if you're a child of God because God the Father loves his enemies. 
You got to good, do good to your enemies if you're a child of God. Because God the Father does good to his enemies for a point in time. Be perfect if you're a child of God because your father is perfect. You see shared characteristics, right? To be a child of God is to share in the nature of God. To be a child of God is to exhibit the characteristics of God. If God your father is holy, you have to be holy if you're his child. If God the father makes peace, you make peace. If God the father does good to even his enemies, you good do, good, do good to your enemies. So you see what it means to be a child of God? Do you see what it means to be a child of God? It means to be given life by God, to be created by God, to be sustained by God, to be guarded by God, to be protected by God, and to share the nature of your father and exhibit his qualities. Did it sink in or no? First John chapter three, verses one to three. First John chapter three, verses one to three. Watch here. We're almost done with this section. First John chapter three, verses one to three. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Notice what it means to be a son of God. Therefore, the world knoweth, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. See, to be son of God means you're destined to become something. If you're a child of God, that means you're destined to become something. You're not that thing yet. You will be that thing yet. And what are you going to be? Here you go. Read. <clears throat> Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. That's what you're destined to be, to be like Jesus. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Do you see what it means to be a son of God? To be a son of God means to become like Jesus in holiness, purity, love, perfection, and to have a body like Jesus that's physically indestructible. That's what it means to be a child of God. You're going to be like him in his holiness, righteousness, purity, love, mercy, compassion, just like him, and to boot a glorified physical body like his glorified physical body. Is it making sense? And if you still don't believe me, 2 Peter 1 verse 4. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. If you still don't believe me, 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Praise Jesus, King of Kings. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Watch this. Let your mind be blown away. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You partake of God's nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. You partake in the very nature of God, the divine nature, in escaping lust, sin, corruption, and evil. There you go, 2 Peter 1.4. I didn't write it. Peter did. Do you read it? I didn't write it. He did. Now, he explains what it means to partake in the divine nature. You're not going to be almighty. You're not going to be all-knowing. You're not going to be uncreated. 
you're going to be morally incorruptible, free of lust, free of hate, unrighteous hate, unrighteous anger, free of laziness and gossip, anything and everything that's immoral, you will no longer succumb to those desires, no longer carry out those desires, but you're going to be absolutely pure, righteous, holy, loving, and incorruptibly so. You caught it now? Exactly, Lopez. God bless you. So you understand what it means to be a child of God and God is our father? Let me sum up because there's one more sense that I want to talk about. God is our father in that he creates, makes everything, gives life to everything, sustains everything. God is our father in that he protects, guards, fights for his children. All right? So in that sense, God as our father, in the sense of being creator, sustainer, maker, and life giver, is the father of every creature. All spirit creatures are children of God in that sense, including Satan, even evil spirits. All human creatures are children of God in that sense, even evildoers, right? Amen, Enzo. We love Jesus and I love you, right? And when God heals someone from a disease or protects someone from death or harm, he's acting as a father. Now, the term son of God, daughter of God, can mean one who receives life from God physically, biologically, and spiritually. Those who receive spiritual life from God are the born-again Christians who become spiritual children of God. But everyone, everyone who receives biological life everyone who is given physical life is a child of god in that sense right with me there and another sense in which we're children of god in that we reflect the nature of god exhibit the qualities of god and share in the moral and corruption of god right Did everyone get that thus far? Now, there's another sense in which the Bible uses the term son of God and father of. You with me there? There's another sense. This is a sense that God only conferred upon David and his sons. Share in his moral incorruption. Reflecting his moral purity and corruption. There's another sense in which the Bible uses the term son of God and father of. And this is a sense only given to David and his sons who sit on his throne. God promised David. God promised David. Sorry, I had to just pose. Okay. God promised David that God's earthly throne. God's throne in Jerusalem would be gifted to David and his sons. Follow with me, guys. Follow with me. God promised David. God swore to David. God's throne on earth, God's throne in Jerusalem, was gifted, covenanted to David and his sons. Stop hating, bro. They're the same size. Okay? Okay, stop hating. No, no definition. I've been in the gym, but it's getting there, guys. Stop hating. Okay, are you with me there? Lord Jesus willing, this year I'm going to get my tone back. Okay, everyone with me there? First Chronicles 17, 10 to 14. First Chronicles 17, 10 to 14. Almost done. Hey, love by God, I'm going to relax you in a minute. You tell me relax again. First Chronicles 17, 10 to 14. Read with me. Read. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, God speaking through Nathan to David, you got to read this. Read this. Over my people Israel. 
Moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. David, I will subdue your enemies. You notice he's acting as a father. I will fight your enemies and protect you. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord Jehovah will build thee in house. Watch. And it shall come to pass when thy days, when thy days be expired, you die, that th thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sins, and I will establish, establish his kingdom. My earthly kingdom, I'm going to give it to your sons. Pay attention. Right? Now, verse 12. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. That's what Hebrews 1.5 quoted. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee, but I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne will be established forevermore. Guys, did you catch it? David, here's my promise to you. Here's my covenant with you. My earthly throne and kingdom will belong to you and your sons forever. My throne on earth will belong to you and your sons forever. When your son sits on the throne, that's when I'll be his father and he will be my son. And I will fight your enemies and subdue your enemies. Did you catch it? You caught it? By the way, Hebrews 1.5 was quoting 1 Chronicles 17 verse 13. Let's look at it again. 1 Chronicles 17 verse 13. And I'm going to do a part two on this. First Chronicles 17, verse 13. Let's look at it one more time. I will be his father. He shall be my son. Notice the promise to David. I will be his father. He shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. Now let's look at the other quotation that Hebrews 1, 5 cited. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7. Because I'm almost done. Watch here. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion in Jerusalem. Zion is in Jerusalem. I've appointed my king in Zion. Notice what God says. When my king begins to rule in Zion, that's the day I will be his father. He'll be my son. The day when my king on earth takes the throne in Zion and Jerusalem, on that day when he begins ruling in Zion and Jerusalem, I will be his father, he'll be my son. Psalm 2.7. I will declare the decree, Jehovah has said to me, thou art my son, this day I've begotten thee. See, the day you take the throne and rule on my throne on earth, that's the day I become your father, you become my son. Did you catch it? This sonship is given only to David and those who sit on the throne. This is what I call, this is what I call royal sonship. Royal sonship. Royal Davidic sonship. Okay, what does that mean? God promised David and his sons who sit on the throne that when you sit on my throne in Jerusalem on earth, Okay, the day in which you and your sons begin ruling on my throne in Jerusalem on earth, that day you'll be my son, that day I become your father. You with me there? Royal Davidic sonship. So now let's see what Hebrews 1 5 was quoting. Hebrews 1 verse 5. Why is it Davidic? Because it's a promise to David and his sons only. And it's a promise to begin ruling as king, royal. Hebrews 1.5. Let's unpack it. Yep, start it with David. Notice what two passages Hebrews is citing. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. That was Psalm 2.7, which we just read. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
That was 1 Chronicles 17, verse 13, which we just read. So you see what the author of Hebrews did? He quoted Psalm 2-7. He quoted 1 Chronicles 17, verse 13, which referred to David and his heirs ruling God's throne on earth. And in the day which they begin ruling, they become God's son. Are you with me there or no? You understand what he's citing here? The promise to David and his heirs, his human sons, that they will be the sons of God the day in which they sit on God's throne to rule. Are you with me there? Because I have to do a part two of this. Okay, what does that mean? Why, why is... Send this dirty, filthy dog on his way. Look at the name he's using, Brett Michaels. What a dirty pervert. Why is Hebrew citing Psalm 2-7 about David and his sons and 1 Chronicles 17-13 about David's heirs who were promised that the throne on earth is yours forever? Why is he citing those passages in reference to Jesus? Why wouldn't it start with David, boss? When David was the man God appointed to represent him on earth because he rejected Saul and Saul's line. Why are they applied to Jesus? Why did the author of Hebrews apply it to Jesus? Enzo answered it. Why are these two prophecies applied to Jesus, showing that Jesus fulfilled those promises? Promises about David and his sons who sit on the throne of David on earth. And when they sit on the throne on earth, they become God's sons in a royal sense. Why are they applied to Jesus? I'm still waiting for the answer. Come on, guys. I need more people. Yep, because Jesus is the human son of David who now becomes the human heir of David to inherit the throne of David. And in that sense, he now becomes the royal son of the father. So there's a sense in which Jesus becomes God's son. This has got to sink in. Jesus as the divine Word of the Father has always been God's Son in that sense. But then Jesus becomes a different kind of Son of God. He becomes the royal Davidic Son of God. But for him to be the royal Davidic Son of God, he first has to become human from the line of David. And then as a human descendant of David, sit on the throne as David's representative and the day when he sits on the throne as David's representative, he becomes that kind of son. That's why it says he inherited a name superior to the angels. And G God says to Jesus, you are my son. And today I've begotten you because he's not talking about Jesus as God. Jesus as God, that as the son of God, he is the eternal one with the father. He's talking about Jesus as the royal Davidic son, the son of God from the line of David. Are you with me there? Because I got to end it soon and I'm going to continue the theme. Are you with me there? The reason why Psalm 2-7 and 1 Chronicles 17-13 are quoted in reference to Christ. Passages about David and his heirs, human heirs, his sons, sitting on God's earthly throne, representing God. And on the day they begin ruling, becoming God's royal sons. Applied to Jesus is because Jesus became a human son of David to fulfill the promises to David 
to sit on the throne of God as David's heir. And the day in which he sat on the throne as a son of David, he becomes a royal Davidic son of God. A son in a different sense, which he wasn't before he became human from the line of David. This is why people get confused. I thought he's already the son of God. How did he become the son of God? Because you're talking about sonship in two different senses. He's already the son of God as God. As God, he's the eternal son, one with the father before creation. But as the royal Davidic son of God, a son of God that requires him being a human son of David, sitting on the throne as a human heir of David, that only became a reality for him when he became man from the line of David and when he went to heaven to rule as a son of David. Now, let me explain. Let me explain. Look what Medic is doing. Medic, you've been distracted because you're talking about you not acting like Jesus and now talking about Daniel 3. You know the rules, brother. You know not to change subjects. Brother, don't let the devil use you. May the Lord Jesus seal you for his glory. Stop talking about other things. Okay. Let's come back now to Hebrews 1.5. When... Did Jesus become God's son? He says, you are my son. Today, I've become your father. I've begotten you. What day is Hebrews 1.5 referring to? Jesus has eternally been the son of God. What is he talking about here? What kind of sonship? Servant girl has not even been listening. You're so way off that I'm insulted because that means you haven't been paying attention. What day... Did Jesus become the royal Davidic son of God? What day? Pan Green's another one who's not paying attention, either because I'm failing as a teacher or these ignoramuses are not paying attention, thereby insulting me. Okay, let's try it again. What day did Jesus become the royal Davidic son of God? Let me repeat. Let me repeat. When he died? Wow. I think I'm going to have to block these three individuals. Because clearly they're not listening. They're here just to waste their time and mine. Let me repeat. To be a royal Davidic son of God, you have to be from the line of David and sit on the throne. So let's try it again. To be a royal Davidic son of God, you have to be from the line of David and sit on the throne. What day did Jesus become the royal Davidic son of God? I'm going to be mean when I want your attention for the sake of the Lord, not for me. So, Medic, when he was born to Mary, did he sit on the throne? No, boss. You're so off, it's unbelievable. Hebrews 1 is right in your face. When did he become the royal Davidic son of God? Wow, Jerry Wang. <whistles> My goodness. Unbelievable. And I don't really blame you guys. I blame the pastors. The level of biblical illiteracy, it's disgusting. Most of you got it. Most of you got it when he went to heaven after the resurrection. Because that's when he sat on the throne as a son of David, fulfilling Psalm 2-7, 1 Chronicles 17, 13. Most of you got it, thank the Lord Jesus. Do you understand why Hebrews 1, 5 is cited in reference to Jesus entering heaven after his death to sit at God's right hand? Because that's when he entered as a son of David, as a human heir of David. And that's the day where God the Father says to him, you are my son, today I've begotten you. This day in which you came to heaven, this day in which you sit on the throne as a son of David, this day is when you become that kind of son, of son of God. Jesus Christ is Lord. You're kidding me, right? Transfiguration. You mean all this time, Jesus Christ is Lord, that I wasted an hour in Hebrews 1. You're going to transfiguration? Are you serious? Black Smurf, 
What does that got to do with Jesus sitting on the throne now? Are you reading Hebrews 1, 3 to 5 with me, Black Smurf? Why are you ignoring Hebrews 1, 3 to 5 where it says he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high? Why are you waiting for the future? So Jesus is not sitting. He's dancing and walking in heaven. What are you guys talking about? No, I don't have a lot of patience, medic. If I didn't, I wouldn't be getting animated. Jesus didn't ascend to his father, Bass? Is that what you're saying? No, you don't need me, King of Kings. You need Jesus. Let's read Hebrews 1, 3 to 5, folks, for the context. I'm not discouraged. I will get impatient and angry. I'm going to discourage you because you say, man, Sam is a meanie. I, I don't see Jesus in him. Because, you know, we got these effeminate, wishy-washy Christian. I don't see Jesus in him. Where's the love, brother? Yeah, okay. Go find someone else then. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Let's read. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice it's when he sat down that he becomes better than the angels, being ma made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Notice when? When he sat down after he purged our sins. Now verse 5. Verse 5. For unto which of the angels, you see the four is explaining. For which of the angels did God ever say, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Is it now making sense? Is it making sense now? Okay, let's explain. Before creation, Jesus existed eternally as the divine son of God. Jesus, the person, exists as God before creation. And before creation, he is son of God in respect to his deity. As a divine person, he is the eternal son of the father. Then after creation, Jesus entered creation to become a human being from his blessed mother, who conceived him as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. As a human being on earth, he took on the status of fallen man, became lesser than the angels in status. And as a human being, and as a human being, he became a son of David. Then after he died for our sins and was raised. Okay. Hold on. Okay, is it clear now? I was buffering. Okay. He becomes human and then shares our fallen status, a status that made humans lower than the angels because of Adam's sin. So he became lower than angels in status. But after he died for our sins, he was raised in that physical body. So he still has a human nature. That physical body is indestructible. And as a human being, he then ascended higher than the angels, and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, medic for Christ. You got it. But after he ascended, he entered there not just as God, but as a human being. And as a human being, he's a son of David. So now when he sat on the throne, he didn't simply sit on the throne as God. He sits on the throne as the God-man. And in respect to his humanity, he is a human descendant of David. So now he sits on the throne as a human heir of David. And when he sits on the throne as a human heir of David, he then fulfills the promises given to David that one of David's sons will sit on the throne representing God. And when he sits on the throne... He becomes the royal Davidic son of God. So when did Jesus become that kind of son? When he becomes a human son of David, and as a human son of David, goes to heaven, 
and sits on the throne, that's the day that God the Father says to him, today, my son, you become the royal son of David, the royal Davidic son of God. Which is why Psalm 2-7 can be applied to you, my son, and 1 Chronicles 17, 13 can be applied to you, my son, because now you've become my son in this sense. You've always been my son as God, one with me. But now you become this kind of son of God. You become my, my son in this sense, the royal Davidic son of God. <clears throat> Is that clear? Exactly, medic. God the Son became a human heir of David to represent David as his son. So David's human heir is God in the flesh. So David has God as his descendant and heir representing him on the throne. David has God doing that for him. Exactly, Daily Light, you got it. He's king as a human son of David and king as God, the son of the father. Is that clear? So now let me, because I'm going to do a second part on this, a second part on this. So let me ask you a question. When God made that promise to David and his heirs, remember he said, this throne is yours, David, and your son's. It belongs to you forever. You understand what the author of Hebrews meant when he said, God never made this promise to an angel? To no angel did he say, you will sit on my throne representing me. God only said that to a human being named David and his sons. So you understand what the author of Hebrews is saying? Angels are not God's sons in that sense. To no angel did God ever say, you, an angel, will sit on my throne representing me and being my son in that sense. That's a promise I give to a human being named David and his sons, and I don't make that to any of you angels. You with me there? So Hebrews knows what he's talking about. Hebrews is not saying the angels of God cannot be God's sons in any sense. They are already the sons of God in a specific sense. What he's saying is no angel can be the son of God in this sense of the word. Because no angel has been given God's throne to reign on it forever. That promise is given to a human being and his family, a particular human being, David and his sons. So God would never say that to an angel. Hold on, Jehovah's Witness, but you're telling me Jesus is not a man in heaven anymore. He's an archangel Michael, which means you have Hebrews contradicting himself. Because if Jesus is not a man, but the archangel Michael, then he can never be the fulfillment of the promise of David. So you have Hebrews contradicting himself. Shame on you, you Bible perverts, sons of Satan. You get it? You see why Hebrews is... Annihilation of Jehovah's Witnesses and this cult leader, the son of Satan, Greg Stafford, who's a coward and won't debate me. And I hope you're watching this because I'll decimate you by the power of Jehovah Jesus. You got it? Everything good and awesome from the child of God. Keep praying for me. I'm going to do a part two, Lord willing, on this today. I'll probably do it Thursday. Lord willing, and Honor of September 11, Lord willing, I'll be on tomorrow around 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm sorry, not Eastern, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time tomorrow. I'm going to do, did Jesus prophesy Muhammad to decimate, annihilate Islam by the grace of Jesus Christ? And then, Lord willing, I'll do part two of this talk, Royal Davidic Sonship. And how this destroys the lie of Greg Stafford and Joe's witnesses that Jesus is a spirit creature called the Archangel Michael. I'll do it, Lord willing, Thursday. But I need your prayers. Pray for a miracle. God gets me out of the courts this month free. Preserves the money he's given me for my daughters. Bring my daughters back to me. Helps me to get healthier. Be more holier. More in love with Jesus. More patient. More fruits of the spirit. 
and he sets me free so that by October, I relocate and start a new chapter in my life. And do pray, guys. God, make clear to me this particular person. He knows who she is. If she's the one, to confirm it. If not, to let me free. Set me free for his glory to serve him. And I need you guys to pray about more supporters. We need more supporters to partner with me financially, not less. If you believe God has called me to full-time ministry. Because I plan to teach much more, both on social media and locally. I'll be doing local Bible studies when I relocate, if the Lord wills, for his glory. He doesn't need me. I need him. Father, Son, and Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ, you are Jehovah Almighty to the Father. And we love you. Come sooner than later. Cover us by your blood. Cover my daughters by your blood. And fill us with the Spirit. Give us victory over the flesh. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Make sure to watch this again. Pass it to others. Hit the like button and subscribe. Christ is risen. Risen indeed.